Um, great. So two o'clock, let's, uh, let's get cracking. So uh, my name is Edward Harris. I'm one of the co-founders of Sharpest Mind. So we're uh, hosting uh, Kevin McIver here today, uh, who is going to chat about uh, a really cool project that he has built. Um, so Kevin, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, just a thumbs up if everyone's seeing the, the screen. Okay, yeah, sure, thank you. Let me just grab this here. Okay, so, well, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'll talk about developing an end-to-end -end NLP uh, text generator application. So this is a, a, a Sharpest Mind project that uh, I developed uh, with my mentor, Arman, uh, here in Sharpest Minds. So uh, first, let me talk a bit about me. <clears throat> so um, my background, I'm a mechanical engineer. I work in oil and gas sector with oil production vessels, FPSOs. Actually, this is one of the projects I was, I was on called P58. And I'm from Brazil. I've moved to Canada in 2019. And I'm making a career shift to data analysis. Analysis, I've actually finished a certificate in data analysis, uh, data analytics at Ryerson University here in Toronto. And now I'm pursuing to work with data and innovation. That's what really drives me. So <clears throat> to start here, let's start. Uh, as always, if we're talking about products, we're always gonna have to start with a problem that we wanna solve, right? So in this project here, uh, the thing is that in the era of information and technology, written news is a very important means of communication uh, with a high volume of articles being published every day. So delivering news fast is crucial. So what we wanna do here is help people write news articles, right? And to do that, uh, we want to develop and deploy an end-to-end -end application. And in this, pro in this presentation, I'll go through the steps I've taken to do that. And, and the application at the end will help write news articles by suggesting the next words on the text, of the text. And we'll also want to create an architecture to continuously train the model with new data. So we'll go through the architect architecture too. But Using NLP techniques and tools to improve and facilitate writing in news articles is just one case. Currently, there are many other companies who are working in similar areas, such as everybody probably knows Gmail autocomplete function, where you're writing the, your email and then it just predicts whatever your, the, next, the next word probably is, or the next few words. There's uh, companies such as Grammarly, who works with uh, Microsoft Word to help you better correct your grammar and better write your whatever articles as I say you're writing on or reports. Companies such as EasyOps that use NLP to generate reports from data. And Google with OpenAI working on natural language generators. And it's famous by, for its attention is all you need paper and by launching the GPT-2, which is a transformer for text generation. So what, what we want at the end, we want at the end a product. So this is like the version one of the product, which is a homepage where you can access it just as a, like a, a normal homepage. And you can try on way, which, where you can actually choose a topic that you want to write. You start writing it in the text area, and after a few words, actually five words, the model will start predicting possible next uh, candidates, and then you can choose those and try. Uh, it will help you to write whatever article that you write it on. You can restart the text area if you want to, and and also you could at the end if you if you like you could save the text area into your local file as a txt file. So <clears throat> this is the kind of like the end product that, that we want to achieve. 
And to do that, we also want to use an architecture that can continuously train the, your, your application with new data. So in this presentation, I'll also discuss each block and components of this architecture uh, further on. So the agenda here uh, will be, I'll first talk about creating the text generation model and then creating the application to run that model and deploying it locally, then deploying it on Google Cloud platforms using Kubernetes. And then I'll discuss a bit of the architecture too, going block by block, ingestion block, train models block, test environments, manage container versions and app deployment block. <clears throat> so first uh, we start with the model, right? Uh, so the thing, the, the, as always, the first thing is collecting data. In this case, the first model here, I use the AG's news topic classification data set which is a collection of more than 1 million news articles that we gathered for over more than 2,000 news sources. And it's also divided in four different topics. So it has topics such as words, sports, business, and SciTech. And for this project as a, as a MVP, you could say, I chose to just work with business topics initially. So once I've uh, in it, I, I perform data cleaning, removing URLs and news editors, for example, such as like AP, uh, routers, and so forth. I constructed the vocabulary of the model based on the 20% 20, 20 most frequent words. And that gave me uh, an initial vocabulary of this amount, like 5,566 words. So then uh, I just uh, needed to transform those words into a vector space using embedding techniques. And to do that, I created embeddings based on Glove, which is, is it's an open source embedding that was already previously trained and has, and I used the 6 billion tokens, 4,000 vo uh, words vocabulary with a hundred dimension for embeddings. And for the input approach, I've decided to, to do the input consistent on, uh, and train the model consistent on, the, on feeding it the five previous words to try to predict the next one. So if you look here, kind of like the sample text over here, the input will look like this. So we'll have five words and then the next word will be our label. And this is how I divided to, I divide the, the, the training inputs in the neuro uh, in the neuro model to to train the data set uh, one important issue here was to be careful to generate the inputs uh, for each line and text individually otherwise inputs and labels could be dis disconnected of meaning so for example i had to make sure that i wasn't getting like the f the last five words of this headline and the label being the first word of the next headline, that would make no sense. So uh, once I have the, the, <clears throat> the data clean and prepare for to, to put it into the, um, into the model, I chose the model, the final module, uh, final architecture for the model consists of a bi-directional LSTM stacked with a unidirectional LSTM uh, followed by a dense output layer. The concept behind this architecture is that bidirectional LSTMs can better capture dependencies in the input sequence, which then are fed to the unidirectional LSTM and dense layer to predict the probability of the next words. Uh, for training, the loss function used was the sparse categorical cross entropy, since it works the same as a categorical cross entropy with the advantage of saving time in memory and computation. Once it's, only, it's used only a single integer as a class, rather than a one hot encoded vector. And since we have a large vocabulary, that was useful. <clears throat> and also I tried different activation functions in the bi-directional layer. Uh, and I used two evaluation metrics to, to compare them. Uh, one evaluation metrics is what I call the average uncertainty. 
which is calculated based on one minus the probability assigned to the label if the label was within the top 50 percent 50 the top 50 candidates uh, otherwise it would be zero and uh, otherwise would be one sorry and also uh, another metric here what was the called the hit kind of like a hit rate which consider the average times of, of whether the label was or not within the top 50 percent candidate the, the top 50 candidates sorry so the ideal model should have a total uncertainty of 0% and a hit rate of 100. Uh, but, and based on, on, the, on the experiments here, I, uh, my evaluation was that 10H appeared to have a good balance of uncertainty and predicting the, the, the label within the, the candidates. So further on, I just used the 10H as the activation function with, for the bidirectional STM. And also, to corroborate the assumption that the bidirectional STM had, uh, could perform better than just using unidirectional STMs, I ran both models for a total of 56 epochs, and the results showed that just using unidirectional STMs, they presented uh, more uncertainty and uh, a lower hit rate. So that corroborated the assumption that bidirectional STMs could have, could uh, capture better the dependencies, uh, the input depends, the dependencies in the input sequence. So <clears throat> once I have the model, I want uh, I want to try it to put it into an application that can use that model in a way that for for a user for to solve a problem, right? So that's that's our main goal. To do that, uh, I build an application using Flask. And I decided to, to use actually three different containers, uh, one for a backend, one for the front end, and once, once we'll, one will just be used as a reverse proxy. So the first container here, uh, it's a, a, the API container, has a Flask application that runs a Python script with our model and use the WSD, which is a web server gateface, gateway interface as a protocol of communication. A protocol of communication and the um, what it does is runs the model and then predicts the based on on what text is coming from the front end and based on the last five words it predicts the next probability of the probability of each word of the vocabulary being the next word and then sort the, the probability sort the, sorts the word the the words by probability and get the dictionary of the top 50 candidates and then sends it to the front end. So the front end here called client, uh, the client container has a Flask application that renders the HTML file, CSS and JavaScript, and also sends the requests to backend. So the JavaScript is responsible for listening the events on the web page and sending an XML HTTP request. And it receives, so it sends that to the backend, which then sends it back the top 50 candidates. <clears throat> and then the front end sorts them based on probability and filters them as the user types the next character. So the front end here receives the total of 50 candidates. So uh, as the user is typing, so when the user starts typing the, the, the next word, the first character, for example, the front end will then filter out if it has candidates that has words that begin with that first character, and it will show it uh, show to, to the user uh, also sorted by the probability, as we seen on the first video. <clears throat> so, and the the nginx here container serves as a reverse proxy and manage the request to the front end and communicates it with to the to, to the front end. So here he's just listening to the events in the web page uh, in a certain port and then communicate, send, sending those requests to the front end. And all of those, uh, and all of these files here and directories and applications, they're all inside three different Docker containers. Uh, the idea to, to do this division was also to try to maintain a separation of concern. So 
once we we've created the the files uh, needed to deploy the the Docker containers, we can now use uh, a, for example a Docker dot YML file that will have the steps the to create the images and containerize your application. So once you run here, I'm using Docker Compose up here to run this file, and Docker will take uh, uh, these steps over here and create the proper images of the containers and deploy those con and, and deploy those containers based on the Docker file that's hosted within each of the these directories. So each 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 directory has its own Docker file, and there it would fetch the requirements needed to build the images and deploy the containers. So once the images are 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 run are, are created and you deployed it, then for example here everything's running. You can view it in a, in your local machine, and you could see the applications running. So here's just the show of the application. So <clears throat> now that we have it running locally, we want to uh, be able to, well, give access to anyone to, to, to use your application, right? That's the, the, main, the main objective. So sorry about that. To do that in this project, I used, I chose to, to deploy it using Google Cloud and Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, it's a powerful engine to deploy container applications. It's not the only end, uh, solution that you could use to, de to deploy container applications. It's actually a very powerful one and maybe for a simple application, it could be a kind of like an overkill, but it's main, it's very it's widely used in 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 great in huge companies and as a personal portfolio project i wanted to try kubernetes too and it has cool features such as auto scaling and also rolling updates which will allow to update the version of your application with zero downtime so to run kubernetes at in google uh, Google Cloud Platforms, you actually will need these two services over here, which is Container Registry and Kubernetes Engine. So Container Registry is what will host, like would save the images of your containers inside Google Plat in, inside the Google Platform. So here you have the, con the image for all, the, the, for all three containers. And the Kubernetes Engine is what will run the cluster that will then have inside running the Kubernetes with all its uh, different architectures and services. <clears throat> in the most basic uh, parts of Kubernetes, you could say there are the nodes and the pods. So the pods is the atomic part of Kubernetes that will host the containers of your application. And a pod can host one or more containers. In, in this project here, I chose to each pod to contain the three, the three containers of my application. And that's why, and the reason that's, that's why, because uh, containers inside a pod, a pod can communicate uh, via localhost. So, and the pods, they are inside a node. And they, you also have, so this is all what they call the deployment part. And they also have what they call services. And in this case here, I use the a, a service, a load balancer. And this is what will give you external as access to to your your pods so this the load, load balancer here will talk with the nodes and pods that are inside kubernetes running <clears throat> um, so to deploy that using in kubernetes the first thing you have the first step you have to do is create the cluster uh, which will host uh, everything and after that, you create the containers, the, the images using Docker. You could follow the same steps we, we took on the local, uh, on deploying a local machine part. And after we have those images, we push them to the container registry and then run 
run a .yaml file, which will contain the steps that Kubernetes must follow to do all the deployments and, and deploy all the services too. So here, for example, I ran, I'm running the, uh, ran the command to run the .yaml file, and now I'm, see, I'm watching to see if the containers, uh, the pods were, were created and if the service was, uh, is also available. So it takes a bit of, uh, it takes some time, but I'm gonna fast forward here a bit. So after a while, you can see here, the pod says status running. And if I watch the service, I, I'll be able to see that the load balancer can give me now an external API, uh, IP address, which then I can access my, my application uh, just with a normal website, just like a normal website. So just uh, here, I'm just double checking to see if the containers are running. And here I'm double checking to see if the service is okay. And now if I just go to the API address the service gives me, <clears throat> uh, it will route me to the, takes a while, I'm sorry. So it will route me to the web page, and now it's running live on the web page. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, worldwide, so everyone can have access. Um, <clears throat> so uh, now that I've talked about the model and deploying the and creating the application, deploying it both locally and using Kubernetes, we want to have an architecture that will help us uh, retrain the model and, get, and, and update that models with new data. So the first block here that, we, that I'm gonna talk about the architecture here is the ingest part. So the ingestion block, it, it has a, quite a bit of services here. We have a compute engine, a cloud function, a cloud pub sub, and a cloud scheduler. But the job's fairly simple. And the core job relies on the scraper, which is the compute engine. The rest here is just to start and shut down uh, this compute engine in a certain frequency, which I'll talk about later. So the compute engine uh, for, the, for the scraper, it has a simple job, which is scraping web articles from a page and putting that into a txt file that will later be used for retraining the model <clears throat> so since this is a, it's a simple job you first create the compute engine and just configure it with python and your scripts and pip and uh, create the environments that you need the requirements of whatever libraries that you need and after that uh, what what the the main function of this compute engine will be to fetch the weak data txt, which is the a collection of data that were, that is being captured throughout the week, and that's inside a bucket in cloud storage. So it will first read uh, fetch this weak data txt, and it will crawl uh, in this case Google News. Uh, bis in the business topics, it will crawl this URL here and create and grab the news articles and then append this new articles, new data to the weak data and then update that weak data on cloud storage. Since it's a very simple <clears throat> application, the, you could use a very, very simple compute engine. So in this case, I use a ShareCore F1 micro with 60. 640 megabytes. I think that's like the, the low of the low of what you can go here in compute engine with Google Cloud. <clears throat> but once you have uh, that inside the, the, your compute engine, what you want to is that every time the compute engine is initiated, you want it to run all, all of those steps. So to do that, you use startup scripts, which are they, you can configure those whenever you're creating the, the instance inside the metadata. And you can put that, those starter scripts. So whenever the compute engine is, is turned on, it will run that starter script. And then you can just have it automatically doing everything that you want. So in this case here, you could see I basically activate the environment, 
run the script, the, the script, script, fetch the weak data that's being hosted in the bucket, and then I create within the scrape, I create a new data, which then I join, uh, I use another Python script to join append the, the new data of the day with the weak data I had. And I update that weak data.txt in the bucket at Google storage, and then I shut down. <clears throat> so we talked about the scraper here, which is the core part of the ingest block. The rest here, the, this part here is just, as I said, to, to start and shut down the scraper in a certain frequency. So for that, I use Cloud Scheduler, Pub Sub, and Cloud Functions, which I'll show a bit more now. So Cloud Scheduler, they run cron jobs. Uh, so in this case here, you could see the Cloud Scheduler. I have a frequency here. In, this here translates to every day midnight. And at that, at that uh, time, it will run a certain job. So here it will, it will actually send uh, a payload to this topic to PubSub. So what this payload has uh, describes here is the zone of your compute engine and a label. So I'm doing this because uh, when I created the scraper en uh, compute engine, I set this label inside it. So by doing that, if later on I have more scrapers running, for example, one for each topic, then whatever scraper has these labels here, they will be activated. They all will all be activated by the same function. So at midnight, the, the cloud scheduler will send this to PubSub that then will be retrieved by whoever is the subscriber of this topic over here. So in this case is a cloud function, which as it says, just runs a function. So in this, uh, the function it's running, it's, it's to start the instance or to shut down the instance. And it's all in Node.js code that can just put it into the cloud function. So, <clears throat> Uh, now, I've talked about the ingest block. I want to talk about the train model block. So as you can see uh, by the architecture here, both models, they're very similar. The only difference here is I just didn't put any shut down cloud schedulers. That's because this, since this is a very simple job, uh, I could just figure out like, more than five minutes is enough to, to run the job. I just put that just to be sure that the scraper will be turned off. Although the start to script of the scraper already has a shutdown uh, command. So just to be double sure. Uh, in this case here, since I'm training a model and that could take a while uh, and also as, pass, as time passes that the, the, the training time could also increase. I decided just to have uh, the startup cloud scheduler. And in this case, it will run once a week. So as, uh, as in the ingestion block, the train model, the core of it relies on the compute engine train here. So what does the, the compute engine do? do? Uh, the compute engine, it, in this case, now that we're retraining the model, we have to go to a bit more complex and more powerful machine. So I went to a four CPU, five gigabyte memory. I think it resembles a bit the configuration of, of Google Colab machines. And what it does, it first fetch this data here that's also stored in the cloud storage. So what, what are each of it is this data? So the weak TXT it's what I told before, it's the accumulated news of the week and it's created by the ingestion block. The vocab.data, it's the current model's vocabulary. The master data.txt is uh, the current collection of the data that, that was used to train the last model. So it's all the collection I've, like uh, we've done to uh, up to now. 
And the embedded dot npy here is a numpy array containing the current spotting embeddings to the current vocab. Uh, the glove, as I've talked before, is just the glove word embeddings that we're using. And the model matrix.txt, it's a log containing the metric evaluation for all the models already trained. So this is just a log. So the first thing it does, it's, it fetches up all this data over here and then runs uh, the Python script to retrain the data. And after it finishes, it then updates everything, sends it back to the cloud storage, and it rates, erase all the data that was on the weak, weak data TXT. Why? Because during training, what it will do, it will append the weak data to the master data and, train, and retrain the master data. And also update the vocabulary based on whatever were the most frequent words in the weak data. And so we want to erase the weak data after training because now the ingestion block will start feeding the weak, the weak data again for the next week. And we don't want to, for the next training session, to repeat data again, which, which that, that could mess up the model. And also, when the compute engine finishes, it sends to another folder inside the, the bucket on cloud storage, it will send to a folder the new embed, new vocabs, and the new models, and it will tag them also with the day the training session occurred. So now I'll have a log of the training of the, the files I need to run the new model for one, two. Uh, an important thing here is that for now, this compute engine took about 30, uh, 13 hours to run the run 30 epochs. And as, uh, as time goes by and master data will increase, then probably a more powerful machine will be needed, maybe GPU or TPU, and or I'll have to limit the amount of data which I want to retrain the model every week. So maybe instead of just collecting more and more data and having that, maybe just limiting by X amount of the, of the last data. Um, so now that the model is trained and we have the new models here stored in our cloud storage, we go to the test environment block. So the purpose of the block is just as a gatekeeper, it's we could in a way, uh, if you want to, uh, having the new models just deploy the new version of your, uh, uh, on your, on the application. But then we want to test it to see if it's, everything's running okay first. So that's what this block is about. So we, we want to per, per, uh, see if the model is performing as expected. And, and also we maybe we want to do other updates, maybe change our layout, change our front end. So we could do that too. So basically here, what we do is we fetch the, the updated models. So the embed vocab and models, we fetch those. And we also fetch the, the rest of the, of the files we need to deploy our application locally. And then follow the same steps we took uh, for, for deploying it locally using Docker and test it locally. So if we are, we could, you could do that on Cloud Shell or you could do that on your own machine if you want to. Uh, once, if the model performs okay, what we can do is just update those files and push them into uh, the Git repository that's, that's hosting the project. So uh, now we go to the managed container version block so what this block does is, it's a way to update the, your application in a more automatic way. So <clears throat> what, what we're gonna use here is the cloud source repository, cloud bill and cloud shell, sorry. And the core part here is the cloud bill, which I'll talk about uh, later on. So, Cloud Source Repository serves like a, like a private GitHub in a way. Uh, in this project, you could use Cloud Source Repository 
or you, in, in, in this project per se, I'm actually hosting my project on GitHub and CloudSource repository is just mirroring my GitHub repository. But here you could see there's uh, all the, the updates I did or commits I pushed to, to my GitHub. And what, what we're gonna do now is use a trigger build to whenever I have modifications on my GitHub, it will invoke this trigger that will then invoke Cloud Build. So in here, uh, what I'm doing is uh, using trigger build and I'm, do, I'm, I'm putting that whenever I make any modifications on my GitHub project repository, that will invoke the trigger, which will then look for a cloud build.yaml file, which will be used by cloud build to follow a certain, certain number of steps, uh, configure steps. So what cloud build do is it looks for this cloud build.yaml file and then follow each of the steps. So in this case here, what, what cloud build.yaml is telling is, okay, so look, uh, we updated the GitHub repository, fetch the, the documentation, run Docker to create new images, push those images to cloud, uh, to container registry, and then update the pods images with these new images, new versions over here. So this is a way to automatically, in, in a way automatically uh, perform and update versions of your application with zero downtime. And so once cloud builds runs uh, and execute everything, then your whichever cluster that's running your application will update the images of the of the pods and you will then have the application running with the, within the new version that you want to so the last block here is the app deployment but basically what this block is doing is what we discussed earlier during the deployment using kubernetes so here i'm just showing how the managed container version and the app deployment uh, work together. So once the trigger is invoked and cloud builds is activated and runs through all the steps, it deploys the new images to, to Google container, uh, Kubernetes engine that would then update what, whichever cluster you're working on, update the images of your pods, and that will be now visible for the external, for the users. So now we've ran through the whole full architecture. Uh, I hope that you guys now can see more of what every piece here is doing and how this, it's working in this application here. Uh, so this is, uh, as I said, it's, 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 it's a project for a personal project here in Sharpest Minds and it's an ongoing project. So there's always a lot of upgrades I can work on. So I just put here some of the next steps I could, to, I could take. Uh, one of them is to include Ammoflow, which is an open source platform for machine learning life cycles. And Ammoflow can help manage logs of training sessions, including parameters that, that were used, what data inputs that were used. So as we go further on and we develop maybe test different different models and test with new data so we can keep a track of all the parameters and inputs and that would be useful if you want to run those again maybe in a different machine or just have it as a way to monitor how uh, our models were created other thing is in this case i just as a like a version zero version one you could say I just use the business topics, but I could also use the same architecture just to implement more topics and have the front end user choose what topic they want to write and that will then invoke different models. And I also <coughs> I wrote everything in the JavaScript part, I wrote everything in plain JavaScript. Uh, maybe I could uh, use the front, uh, rewrite the front end using React, that would be one thing. And also, 
test and deploy the application with more complex models. As an example, the GP2, GPT-2 that I, I mentioned earlier, or just uh, maybe invoke more, more layers or just more nodes maybe, or more hidden nodes of the, of, of the model. And that probably will mean also increase the compute power of my architecture. And finally, uh, other, uh, I, I ran everything on Google Cloud Platform, but for sure, the same thing could be done on using different cloud providers. So maybe testing it, doing it, everything in other cloud providers that will also be well, uh, another step that I could take. <clears throat> Do, so if, if, if you guys like the, the presentation and if you wanna learn more, I had written a five, these uh, five piece series in Medium. So where I explain a, a bit more of the steps I took on developing the application, running it in Docker, Kubernetes, and doing the, uh, the CI CD architecture for training the model with new data. Um, uh, sorry, just a quick question uh, from Vijay. He's saying a great project and presentation. What is the cost for all uh, the Kubernetes clusters and compute engines add up to? Okay, up to now, it, it, the, the bill was uh, around $9. But that's not really a fair assessment because uh, I ran the, the clusters. What, what, what's, what's cost more is the, is the Kubernetes. And what I did was I would run it, I would test it, but then I would just shut down and eliminate the clusters. So it's not really a fair assessment to see how much it will cost. But it... it if not so many people are using it in the and pulling in the request, uh, I think you could you could play around with the credits you have with with Google Cloud. Uh, I just want to I don't I don't know if that uh, if that answered the question. But, uh, that's what I have, and I just also like to thank have a special thank here to Arman which has been my mentor in this project and helped me through all this and pushing me to, to work harder and learn a bit more of everything. It's, all, it's, it's my first project running Flask and doing things in JavaScript. So it took me a while in Docker too, Kubernetes. So it took me a while to figure it out. But thanks for Armin and also thanks for Edward for it's always helping me and it's always available for helping me for job hunting and sharpest minds to for hosting this, this this event. And if you guys want to have reach me, the, there's my LinkedIn. You can also see my, the GitHub where I have all the documentation there, and or read my medium post as I said before, that that take a bit more detail step by step. So thanks and stay safe, guys. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Um, that was that was awesome. Uh, does anyone have uh, any other questions they'd like to ask? If you want to uh, ask any final questions to Kevin, please uh, message them on the chat, and we can uh, we can go through them. Uh, I'll give folks like a, a few seconds. You can also yeah. feel like you can uh, unmute yourself and just say like, "Hey, I have a question." Uh, if you prefer that, that is totally fine. Um, but. Uh, yeah, definitely a lot of like uh, data engineering stuff. Okay, so uh, Gorang has a question here. Um, how long did it take you to finish this? Good question. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, if, if I start thinking about the, like when I start training the models, I think it took about four or five weeks uh, to do it. Maybe Armin can have a better assessment. Uh, I'm really cloudy in my, <laughs> in, in my history here, but uh, but uh, most of it was also because I've I've hadn't had any previous experience using either Flask, uh, JavaScript, uh, Docker, or Kubernetes. So I just had to kind of like you know uh, learning how to ride the bicycle while you're trying to mount the bicycle at the same time. So yeah, so maybe if you have a previous experience, that would, it would be much much faster. That's actually very impressive. If you have some prior experience in Python, like, you know, you can probably learn Flask pretty quickly, but then yeah. Docker is like another layer and then Kubernetes is an, a third layer of abstraction on top of that. Um, yeah. 
for me, like the like the most difficult parts were definitely Kubernetes, uh, because you think once you deploy the Docker, you think like, oh, that'll be easy, and then stuff don't really communicate. You have to make some minor changes on the on your documentation. And others, uh, the other part was the JavaScript because uh, I'm I'm not really used to doing front end. So like to make that that uh, to make those candidate words appear in the cursor whenever. So that that took me a while to figure it out. So yeah, yeah. JavaScript is not the same as Python at all. There's a there's a big learning curve. Um, mm -hmm. Jaya is asking, how did you come up with the full architecture? Were there several iterations? Oh, sorry. I sorry. I actually okay. We'll we'll go through Jaya's question. I skipped a question. I apologize. But uh, yeah. So how did you come up with the full architecture? Well, uh, it's it's kind of like a. It, there's two, 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 two parts actually. One part, uh, it's basically a Frankenstein of other stuff you keep searching on, 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 on just tutorials and whatever. So for example, the ingestion part and the training models, how to make the, the instances shut down and start up, that's basically you can run, there's a tutorial in, in, for, in Google Cloud that will basically tell you how to do that. Uh, so I know I wanted that to make some Chrome jobs to execute the compute engines, but the rest of the part of the envir uh, of the cloud build was also checking out different different projects, and then combining everything together is just like training on my mind and seeing whatever works. There weren't so many different iterations. I think this is the second one. I just uh, the first one didn't have the test environment, so so. Uh, kind of like explicit. Makes sense. Uh, and then Hao Yang is asking, uh, what's your plan after this project? Are you open for new work opportunities? Would you be more interested in MLAI or infrastructure and DevOps? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, as I said, I'm transitioning careers. So actually I'm, I'm looking for my first uh, uh, experience uh, in working in data, right? So I've been, I've been learning programming about three years now since I decided, before I decided to, 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 to come to Canada, I knew I wanted to change my, uh, change careers. So I've made that move. And now, I, now I'm just want to gain some experience. So I'm open to whatever comes actually. Awesome. Um, and actually uh, on that vein, is there, uh, I guess you had your, um, your, uh, your contact points uh, on up on the last slide, but um, if you want to maybe just like toss your maybe toss your email onto the the chat if folks want to get in touch with you, I'm not sure if, if that's something you're open to, but uh, if so, you sure. Can... Uh, no, sure. Oh, oh, I'm okay. Uh, let me just open the chat here. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's definitely like a, a significant learning curve in a in a short period of time. Like all of those things are pretty, obviously like there's, there's multiple layers of abstraction there getting up to Kubernetes, thanks. And, uh, and then JavaScript, like again, uh, not at all the same as Python. There's a lot of, um, were, you, were you writing like a, a, a node server as well, or were you just like doing the front end mostly in JavaScript, with JavaScript? No, just front end doing JavaScript. Uh, didn't really use uh, like Node.js. Oh, no, you sorry. You're... No, no, no. I did. I did. I didn't. Just like just pure JavaScript and XTML, CSS. So, gotcha. yeah, the JavaScript like the 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 hardest part was doing the. It, it's was the the forms the the building the forms on that. That was the hardest part because it has to invoke like put that in the correct position, calculate that that position, and then also sorted by by the word that's being typed by the user and sorted by the probability of 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 the candidates so yeah yeah front end is is surprisingly uh a pain in the butt <laughs> which is why we need to react says armand yes indeed um <laughs> Yes, indeed. But that's its, sure. its, own, its own layers of abstraction. Um, awesome. Well, uh, okay. I'll give folks a last, okay, uh, actually, a question from Chen. How's the performance of the model in the real world? Have you tested the model performance with a real user? Well, I've tested with some, uh, some people. Uh, but to be honest, uh, the model, it captures some, 
for example, it will capture basically like uh, prepositions and that would be, that, that would be okay. And you could see it will capture uh, some words, uh, for example, stock and price, it will always save that or financial results or it, it, so you could see there's a, uh, th there is a learning, uh, there, there was a learning curve there and that, that could be shown by the model, but uh, at the same time, uh, whenever you try to run a bit of uh, things that aren't so close to business articles, they're a bit away, so that then, then it doesn't really work too, too well. It would just uh, work more with like prepositions and so forth. But yeah, maybe, as I said, this was a, a, a simple model for version zero, just to two stacks LSTMs. Maybe if I could use a different model or a different approach, I'm just using based on the five previous words. I chose that because I didn't want to include a lot of words because then the, the user has to input all those words before the model starts actually doing stuff. But I uh, didn't want to put too many, too little so, so that it wouldn't capture so, so much dependencies, input dependencies. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and then it looks like the J has a, a comment. Glove embedding can only take you so far, right? I would recommend fine tuning GPT, GPT2 uh, with the new weekday dot text. Um, yeah, that, that's true. Uh, there's, there's a lot of words that will end up uh, also being out of vocabulary in the, in the glove uh, embeddings and that, that was set up to zeros, just like a normal zero, zero mask. Uh, I've, uh, I've worked that because also like whenever it's not in the vocabulary, I just change the words to unknown. And so that also works as a, as a way to avoid, uh, avoid the, uh, try to bypass the, the limits of, of glove. But that's true. And I actually tried uh, running it on GPT-2, just the model, but I wasn't sure on the time response of using GPT-2 in this application because it takes a while to generate the, the, the predictions. Maybe if I use a, a, a higher compute power, a compute engine, that, that could work, yeah. But that's definitely step two. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely a good model. Um, awesome. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Kevin. And uh, if, if anyone have any, has any final questions, feel free to post them up. Uh, give folks a couple of seconds. But if not, I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, thanks a lot for, uh, for the time and for the, the awesome explanation and for answering everybody's questions. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having the, the, this event. And, and just thanking Armand again for being the mentor and working with me on this, on this project. It's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you guys for watching. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks very much. Take care, yeah. folks, and have a good, good one. Bye.